here at St. John the Apostle United Methodist Church. We're a community of grace committed to making disciples, and I am the Reverend Gary Turner, the interim senior pastor, and I am in my last month of ministry as the congregation prepares to receive its regular senior pastor, the Reverend Dr. Nisa, Lisa Nesloni, on the 1st of February. One of the roles of a transitional interim pastor is to prepare a congregation to receive its regular pastor. And so during the month of January, I will be preaching a sermon series called Fruitful Practices in a COVID-19 World. And it is a sermon series that is based upon a book by Bishop Robert Schnazy called Five Practices of Fruitful Congregations. And so if you are not a member of SJA, these sermons may seem to you to be more of a, uh, of a bit of a family talk. And yet as this congregation prepares to receive its new pastor, I pray that these sermons may prepare you to have a deeper walk with Jesus Christ. Now let's receive these announcements. Hello, I'm Darla Rosebrook. I am the communications admins person here at St. John the Apostle, and these are your announcements. Along with these pre-recorded online services, we offer one in-person worship service and sanctuary at 10 a.m. each Sunday. Reservations are required to attend. You can make your reservation to attend by online link provided in your weekly e-newsletter, or you can call the church office. All COVID-19 protocols are followed for these services. The men's fire pit meets tomorrow evening at 6.30 around the SJA fire pit. All men interested in discussing spirituality are welcome to attend. This is the final Sunday for our special Christmas offering for the Romero Families Ministry in Guatemala. 
We have a long history supporting this wonderful family's important mission in Central America, and we'd love to get them started in 2021 on strong financial ground. You can give online through the SJA website. Okay, kids, it's time to come on down in front of your TV or your computer, and let's share in this moment together. Well, 2021 is finally here, and it is shiny and new and fresh. Isn't it fun to get something that's new, especially something that's shiny and new? Maybe a new car or a new toy or a new house. It's always fun to have something new. And isn't it fun to make something look clean again that was old? So let's say you got a stain on your favorite shirt, and then your mom can get the stain out um, somehow, like through a special eraser or special pin, and all of a sudden your shirt is brand new again. Or what about your tennis shoes? You get them all muddy, or you get your bike tires all muddy, and somebody helps you wash it clean again. It's such a great feeling. You know, that's kind of like our relationship with Jesus. Jesus makes us shiny and new and clean again when we have Jesus in our hearts. And every time we mess up, we can tell him that we're sorry and we can ask for forgiveness. And he washes us clean all over again. In the Bible, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. So now is the time to make some changes in your life. Make good decisions, treat people kindly, give to others, and you'll begin to feel all shiny and new and clean again with Jesus in your heart. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we are so thankful for you making us clean, even when we don't feel like we deserve it. Help us to follow you and share you with others all the days of our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us pray. Merciful God, as we have closed out the year 2020 and now have entered into the year 2021, we truly do pray that in this new year that you would pour out your mercy upon us. Lord, as we reflect back upon 2020, we are all so aware of the pain and the devastation which the pandemic has brought to our world. But also, O oh God, in reflection, we can recall those times in you in which you have been extremely close to us 
and in which we have experienced your provision and your love in very, very special ways. And so it is with anticipation, O oh God, that we look to the new year, understanding that it, will, it too will bring its own challenges, even as we continue to live in the midst of the pandemic. But God, it will also bring many, many sources of blessing. And so I pray for all of those under the sound of my voice that they may experience your blessings in full, full to overflowing, that we may give you the honor and the praise and the glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's scripture reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. We, who are strong, ought to put up with the failings of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but, as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by the steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. May the Holy Spirit speak to us through this scripture. Thanks be to God. My first appointment as an interim pastor was to Western Hills United Methodist Church at the base of Franklin Mountain in El Paso. That church has one of the most unique, unique sanctuaries that I have ever seen. Its semicircular structure was a, an architectural wonder that gave rise to opportunities for evangelism. On one occasion, a very faithful church member whose name is Jerry greeted a guest who walked in and was kind of looking around and he said, you looking to buy the place? Well, now, not all of us can be maybe as quick-witted as Jerry was. But, you know, the thing that caught my attention about that particular circumstance or situation was the fact that Jerry talked to a guest. How hard is it to walk up to someone and to say, Hi. I'm glad you're here. Do I know you? In an article in the Circuit Rider magazine, Bishop Robert Schnazy tells the story of a woman who is going through a rough time in her personal and professional life. And in her search for connection, hope, and direction, she began to visit a few churches Bishop Schnazy said this, after her first two worship experiences for which she came alone, sat alone, and left alone without anyone speaking to her or greeting her, her prayer for her next visit to another church service was simply, I only pray that someone speaks to me today. He goes on to say, what an indictment could that really happen to visitors in our congregation? The truth is, I've had that experience, even as a bishop. When I arrive at a church and start looking for the office, sometimes I pass by 40 or 50 people with no one offering to help me find my way. Despite my obviously being lost and my active searching for signs. At a few churches, 
I've had greeters offer perfunctory handshakes without even looking me in the eye, handing me a bulletin, and pushing me along without any personal engagement or warmth. Part of my ministry as a chaplain at DFW Airport is a ministry of hospitality. As I walk through the terminal, I look for those people who may seem just a little bit lost or may not know exactly where they need to be going. And I'll simply walk up to them and ask if I can help. And most, with grateful appreciation in their voice, respond, can you tell me this or can you tell me that? And even in those particular circumstances where the traveler may not speak English, they can hand me their boarding pass and I can look and identify their, their flight number and simply walk them to their gate or point them in the right direction. However, there's a significant difference between what I do at the airport and what we do as a church. I may in some small way be pointing people to a God who loves them, but we offer a place where not only can we show them a God who loves them, but we can offer them a community of forgiven and reconciled individuals who can help them discover the depth of God's love for them and guide them on a path to discipleship. Bishop Schnazy says, vibrant, fruitful, growing congregations practice radical hospitality. Now he goes on to say that, that those two words are not usually used together, but he, he said they probably should be. When we add the modifier radical to the word hospitality, we are describing that which is, quote, drastically different from ordinary practices outside the normal, that which, that which exceeds expectation and goes the second mile. He goes on to say that churches that are characterized by radical hospitality are not just friendly and courteous, passively receiving visitors warmly. Instead, they exhibit restlessness because they realize so many people do not have a relationship with a faith community. Let me repeat that. They exhibit restlessness because they realize so many people do not have a relationship with a faith community. When you think about the people you know who have no church affiliation, do you feel a restlessness? The bishop says, a congregation marked by such hospitality adopts an invitational posture that changes everything it does. Members work with a heightened awareness of the person who is not present, the neighbors, friends, and co-workers who have no church home. But what does that look like in a COVID-19 world? How do we offer radical hospitality when we cannot even gather as we traditionally have? I truly believe that if you are committed to hospitality, you must first be committed to prayer. If you don't have anyone to invite to experience a life in Jesus Christ, it may be because you're not praying for anyone. I would venture to say here that, that, that every person under the sound of my voice knows at least one person who is not a part of a faith community. Earlier this fall, I asked everyone to pray for that person. I pleaded with you to pray each and every day, every night when I pray for our family and our extended family. I include two friends who I know don't know Jesus Christ in a personal way. If you're a member of St. John the Apostle United Methodist Church, when you joined this church, you took a vow to support the church with your witness. 
And if you're going to take that vow seriously, then you need, need to be praying for someone. And if that's what you're doing, then you are ready to move on to the four components of radical hospitality, which Bishop Snazy lists in his book. He says, Christian hospitality refers to the active desire to invite, welcome, receive, and care for those who are strangers. First of all, invite. I would venture to say that the majority of church people are more comfortable with the, are most comfortable with the Bo Peep model of evangelism. You know what the Bo Peep model of evangelism is. Leave them alone and they'll come home wagging their tails behind them. Well, you know, that's not the model that Jesus gave. In the parable of the wedding banquet, Jesus tells us how important it is for everyone that he wants to be at his feast. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not come, did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. The first thing that we need to notice is that the issuer of the invitation is God. We sometimes feel that we are the inviter, but it's not our party. It's not our party. The king is throwing the banquet, and as the parable teaches, the king issues the invitation to go and find and, and invite anyone you find. Bishop Snazy remind, reminds his readers that the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, and the early Methodists practiced hospitality in ways that were considered so radical in their day that many traditional uh, church leaders found their methods offensive. Wesley was disinvited from pe preaching in the Anglican church, even though he remained a clergy in the Church of England throughout his entire life. But he preached to thousands in open fields and on his father's tombstones in order to reach coal miners and field laborers and factory workers. He took the Lord's command seriously. He went to the street corners and invited anyone he could find to come to the banquet, including the poorest of the poor and the underclass. He believed that God's unmerited love was available for everyone before they even know it. It's a doctrine which he called prevenient grace. It is the preceding, preparing grace that draws people to God. Listen to Schnazy's explanation. According to Wesley, before people ever consciously come to faith, they have inner desires for relationship to God that are stifled, forgotten, neglected, ignored, or denied. By the grace that precedes awareness or decision, God creates readiness for faith in the individual and fosters the nascent eagerness to please God. By God's grace, people may be more ready than we realize to accept the invitation and initiative of Christ that comes through gracious hospitality. Let me say this as emphatically as I can. It's not about you. It's not about you. You are only the messenger in the parable of the wedding banquet, the king did not blame the servants for the people who didn't show up. He just said, go invite someone else. When you invite someone to watch one of our services on YouTube or share a link to Miss Sharon's videos, you can take deep satisfaction in knowing that you have been a faithful servant of the king in delivering the message. 
Next, Christian hospitality also refers to the active desire to welcome. Jesus said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. How many of you have heard heard that before? Well, of course you had. Now let me ask you this. Back in the pre-COVID days, I know that seems like ages ago, but back in the pre-COVID days, when someone showed up at, at our church that you did not know, that is the, the stranger, did you think to yourself, that person is Jesus? That, pers- that person's Jesus. Now, if Jesus looked like Solomon's head of Christ, and yeah, you remember that, don't you? And he walked through the church doors. Would you walk over and introduce yourself to him? Well, of course you would. That is precisely what Jesus means. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Anytime we meet a stranger, we should welcome him or her as we would welcome Jesus. Our scripture lesson this morning says, welcome one another Therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Now, may I expand upon that that passage just a little bit? One of the ways in which our church has given expression to this teaching is through our drive-through food pantry. Every time one of our volunteers welcomes a driver and asks how many families in that and that be how many families that they are feeding. We are acting in the same way that Christ acted. Christ said, I was hungry and you fed me. Christ told his disciples to have the people sit down in groups and he gave them something to eat. Then after our guests are given food, they are given an opportunity to have one one of our our prayer team members pray for them, to share their, their concerns. You see, when we do all of this, Paul says that we're not just being kind, we're bringing glory to God. There is a, a higher purpose there. Next, Christian hospitality also refers to the active desire to receive. Radical hospitality moves beyond simply inviting and welcoming. It seeks to accommodate the stranger. In the 18th chapter of Genesis, three visitors come to Abraham's tent and he runs out to meet them and invites them back to to his tent for chicken fried steak. Well, it wasn't chicken fried steak, actually it's cheese and milk and and roast veal. And then the men ask where, where his wife Sarah is. Well, at that time she was actually Sarai. But he tells them that she's in the tent. And then verse 10 says... Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. When we receive the stranger into our fellowship, we have no idea what that stranger may bring to us or who that stranger may be. The writer to the Hebrews says, Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Right now, we are discouraged from entertaining anyone. Even family members are dissuaded from Christmas gatherings. But as we learn to embrace the digital culture, We can introduce our new Facebook friends or our Twitter followers to digital content, which helps them to, 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 which helps to change them from acquaintances online 
to disciples of Jesus Christ. Bishop Snazy says, As the community of faith receives and assimilates newcomers and accepts their spiritual gifts and natural talents, their life experiences and faith perspectives, the church changes and ministry expands. God uses newcomers to bring new life into congregations. Finally, Christian hospitality also refers to the active desire to care. When I accepted the position of intentional interim pastor in El, pa El Paso, I planned to fly back and forth between DFW and El Paso every week. I would fly out of El Paso on Thursday evening and fly back to El Paso from DFW on Saturday evening. And on Wednesday morning, I attended a men's prayer breakfast. And as we visited after the meeting, one of the men asked me how I planned to get back and forth to the airport there in El Paso. And I said, well, I just, I plan to drive my car and park it in the, in the long-term parking area there. And he said, you'll do nothing of the sort. He said, I will organize a group of men who will be willing to, to drive you out on Thursday and pick you up on Saturday. And so by the next week, he had a spreadsheet with people who had volunteered to drive me to the airport and to pick me up. And then after that went on for three or four weeks, one man stepped forward and said, I will be his driver every week. He loved to drive. He said, I will be his driver every week. And so that one man would drive me to the airport on Thursday and pick me up on Saturday. He did that the full time that I was there, including picking me up at 10 till 4 on Christmas Sunday morning so I could catch my 550 flight into DFW so that I could be with my family. Now, that is what I call radical hospitality. The scripture says, you shall also love the stranger for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I would challenge you to treat each stranger with you, that you meet with as much consideration and kindness as you would show Jesus himself. The bishop says that fruitful congregations focus on those outside their congregations with as much passion as they attend to the nurture of and growth of those who already belong to the family of faith. God is doing a marvelous work here at SJA. He is bringing a skilled and passionate minister to this church. And I'm about as excited about this appointment as I have been of any of the ministers who have followed me during my time as an interim minister. But for you to be a fruitful congregation under a new minister, you have to practice radical hospitality. Once more, Bishop Schnazy says, practicing hospitality is not inviting people to join a club in order to enhance revenue through dues. We invite people into that mysteriously sustaining community that finds purpose in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it all begins with prayer. Let us pray, pray together on our knees. Let us pray, pray together on our knees. When I fall on my knees with my face to the so
the custom in most United Methodist churches to celebrate the sacrament of the Lord's Supper on the first Sunday of the month. Likewise, it is appropriate on this first Sunday of the new year to recall the Last Supper which Jesus shared with his disciples on the night before he died. In this holy sacrament, we experience the real presence of Christ through the bread and the cup. St. Paul wrote in the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also the cup. After supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So rain down your love on us. Rain down your love and rain down your grace and cover.